These days, many sources are highlighting the shocking scale of the global mental health crisis and how this affects approximately a staggering 1 billion people worldwide. This is over one seventh of the global population. Unfortunately, as harrowing and monstrous this number is, the investor Christian Angermeyer wrote in a blog post, it is my belief this is a gross underestimate. Ultimately, the number of people needing mental health support is arguably all 100% of the world's population. This is one of the reasons why I invited Dr. Jonathan Sporn, CEO of Gilgamesh Pharmaceutical, to gain more insights into the unmet medical need in mental health and the promising noble psychedelic drug development sector. Uh, you're a scientist, and now you have a microscope. So the microscope obviously has, you know, sort of like the telescope for astronomy. And, um, and people have sort of uh, suggested that, you know, psychedelics are sort of the equivalent of the microscope or the telescope uh, uh, for psychiatry. Dr. Jonathan Sporn is a board-certified psychiatrist, assistant professor at Columbia University, and CEO of Gilgamesh Pharmaceuticals based in New York City, which is developing novel psychedelic-related or inspired medicines to treat mental illness. Dr. Sporn graduated from Duke University and Medical School and University of Miami and did a residency in psychiatry at Tufts New England Medical Center and fellowship at Harvard and the National Institute of Mental Health, where he helped set up the mood and anxiety program. Dr. Sporn was on faculty at Mass General Hospital in Boston and chief of psychiatry at the Boston Area Hospital. After leaving academia, Dr. Sporn was a researcher at Johnson & Johnson in psychiatry and neurology. After leaving J&J, Dr. Sporn worked at Pfizer, where he was an internal disease area expert in psychiatry and worked on various drug programs such as Lurica and led the development program for the antidepressant Pristic. Dr. Sporn left Pfizer to found the biotech company Perception Neuroscience, which is currently in phase two development of a novel antidepressant, R-ketamine. Subsequently, Dr. Sporn co-founded Gilgamesh Pharmaceuticals, which is affiliated with Columbia University to develop new chemical entities inspired by the revolution around psychedelic drugs. Gilgamesh Pharmaceuticals is a Y Combinator startup with funding from various VCs, such as Prime Movers Lab. Gilgamesh expects its first products to enter clinical trials in Q4 2022. Gilgamesh Pharmaceuticals' mission is to develop noble compounds that capture the therapeutic benefits of psychedelics to fundamentally reshape the treatment of mental illness. Gilgamesh's AI-powered platform is accelerating the design and discovery of the new chemical entities, which offer improved safety, tolerability, duration, and efficacy. The Gilgamesh team is a team of passionate neuroscience experts with decades of experience within large biopharma like Pfizer, Merck, Regeneron, Biogen, and Lilly. Exited startups like Perception Neuroscience, Curious Springworks Therapeutics, or Biohaven, and has a profound background in academia like Columbia University, Harvard University, NYU, Yale, and UCSD. In this episode, we talk about the global mental health situation, the history of psychedelic drug development, investors in this promising area, the background story to the foundation of Gilgamesh Pharmaceutical, and the different ingredients needed to structure a noble game-changing drug development company. I hope you enjoy the show the same way as I did. Jonathan, it's good to see you. Where are you currently? I am in uh, Manhattan, on the island of Manhattan in New York City. This is a great place. I would love to go there. How is life in Manhattan these days? It's, uh, you know, surprisingly back to normal. So, you know, the, uh, it seems that uh, uh, everyone's uh, out, hard to get a restaurant reservation. It's, 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 and uh, really? arts are coming back. And so, um, yeah, so I, I, I was not, uh, I had evacuated to the mountains in North Carolina for the pandemic but uh i was not that excited about coming back but now it seems that uh it's kind of the 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 you know the feeling in new york's kind of back 
what what do you like more? Do you like more the life in the city or the life in the mountains? What what's uh... you know I like everything that's not in the middle. You know, <laughs> uh, so if you know it's not the suburbs. I, I like uh, I like being in like. Um, you know, in the mountain, you know, deep in the mountains where I mostly see bears and wild turkeys or, uh, or, or, or in Manhattan, uh, you know, uh, uh, where there's just turkeys. I'm, I'm, I'm going to San Diego next week. I mean, it's also the United States, but it's on the other side. So it's uh, pretty exciting to have, have you here. You are currently in Manhattan in New York. What was the reason why you decided to, to go to move to New York? Well, I I was work. I had moved from working for the government at the NIH to Princeton, and uh, had and was working for them for Johnson and Johnson in in New Jersey. And then um, my uh, wife got a professorship at Columbia, and um, I was a little bored at Chain J at that moment, so I uh, uh, decided I would take a job at Pfizer um, in the head, corporate headquarters here in New York, and. It made you know, and and I I I think though also I I I you know to me uh, you know living in New York was always a goal you know just mm -hmm. I, I like culture. What do you like the most um, living in New York? I like um, I like the 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 uh, the energy the the sort of. Uh, uh, you know, this, this sort of a, uh, you know, people from everywhere that come there that kind of want to, you know, do something that's, that's interesting or, or, you know, kind of are talented mm -hmm. people. And, um, and, and I, I like that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, cultural opportunities and just interesting things. There's always sort of a, you know, some random interesting thing that will happen to you if you spend time here. <laughs> I believe that uh, New York is a, Big, big city from, from my point of view. I live in Vienna. It's uh, 2 million inhabitants. And I think New York is about 15 million, if I remember it right. Uh, no, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, Jonathan, let's jump into the topic of uh, of this podcast. Um, about, I think, six to 12 months ago, I read a couple of uh, posts and articles on LinkedIn from Christian Angermeyer. And yeah. uh, one, one stood out and uh, he, he said... Uh, 100% of the of the world's population has mental health issues and we need to do something against it. And he's advocating... 100%? 100% is going for 100%. He says, everybody oh. needs support. Okay, all right. <laughs> and his solution is psychedelic drugs. And um, I read a couple of his posts and he just pops them up frequently. And one day, I think it was last year in October, I read an article about um, Jonathan Sporn. A former Harvard and NH scientist uh, who's returning to the psychedelics field with a new biotech after selling his last efforts to the Buzzy Atai Life Science, which happens to be funded by Christian Angermeyer. And I'm really happy that you are here today in this podcast, in this episode, so that I can ask you some questions. Uh, let's start with this uh, mental health problems in society and 100%. What's your opinion? How, how, how challenging is mental health these days for our society? Well... Obviously, a hundred percent is hyperbole, and I'm sure you know Christian knew that. But um, I don't really think that I need to convince you or your audience that you know the world right now has uh, you know significant mental health you know challenges, and you can see that I think through so many lenses right now. You know, so um, I think that uh, uh, you know the uh, number of people that have um, anxiety disorders has increased um, mood disorder uh, mm -hmm. suicide rates are very very high and have increased over the years um, uh, you know addiction issues have, have also I think were high and spiked I think further since uh, I'm not really following the exact epidemiology but I, I think that it's even if you just read the newspaper you 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 you'd be uh, pretty well uh, 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 you, you know, and accepting that this is a, a major problem, um, pretty much worldwide. And, and, um, you know, and I think we're, I'm, I'm guessing that we're seeing also that even though the, the pandemic now has, you know, abated somewhat, um, that the world is still sort of, uh, um, 
kind of, you know, the, the sort of after effects you know, or the, the aftershocks of it are still, you know, I think affecting people psychologically. And, you know, um, and as you know, in the U S there's this tremendous uh, violence problem with guns and, um, and, you know, a lot of tragic things going on that, you know, are likely at least in part, um, you know, mental health, uh, related. Yeah, I read about it in the newspaper. It's uh, it's a very sad story about the latest shooting in the United States. Yeah, it's happening every day. Oh, it's really that often. Just get some pretty, some news here. Pretty much, like it's it's literally. Uh, I don't remember how many, but it's you know, there's been already like uh, you know over a hundred of these things in this year. Something. <laughs> Well, what's your opinion? Why is there such a spike? What are what are the root causes of these problems? I, you know, and 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 uh, you know, I I I, I think it, it's always a, a, a risk. People that are not experts in uh, in a particular, you know, in, in in you know, are experts in one thing, but you know, sort of beginning to be, to be uh, asked to be experts in 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 everything. But um, uh, I I think that uh, the I mean, in the U.S., you have mental health problems and you have mental health problems everywhere, um, you know, and um, I think in the U.S., you just obviously have that mixture of mental health problems, plus this, you know, very, very easy availability of lethal weapons um, that I, I'm sure in Vienna is not the case. Um, and so I think, um, you know, so, so I, I don't have a feel for what the mental health situation is in in Europe, but I think that uh, you know the violence issue in the U.S. is sort of driven in part by that, you know, by we weapons. But I, I I think it's also sort of the, in in general the mental health issue is 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 also uh, uh, you know predicated on the fact that people are very uh, have been isolated um, and. Um, and left to their own devices. And I think that sort of, you know, kind of connectivity between people um, and connect and sort of social fabric has been torn rather substantially by, you know, the pandemic. But, it, you know, in in the U.S., it, it wasn't in there, there was a lot. I think that's always been the case that there's, you know, there's been a lot of people that are, uh, you know, I think loneliness, uh, grief, uh, there's, you know, a lot of that. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people have been traumatized. I, I think a lot of the healthcare workers um, uh, have been like living in like a war zone, essentially. Um, so, uh, you know, you put all that together um, and, you know, add, uh, you know, add in potent opiates, uh, you know, that are, you know, you know the, as you know, there's a fentanyl uh, um, is now in pretty much um, a lot of illicit drugs that are flowing um, into countries and um, you know so that, that, that so i think that, that there, there's a lot of factors yeah i agree the pandemic put a lot of stress on people i mean i'm not an expert in that but what is what you get from the news here in austria i mean we don't have uh, we have stricter gun laws than in the united states um but uh one study i got was that uh children already due to the lockdowns and the the, the frequent changes in measures um have uh, the, the mental health issues with children are up to 30 50 percent of all children of all the population here in austria have mental health issues basically um as an after effect of the pandemic and i completely agree to what you say also the healthcare workers had a lot of stress to go through and a lot of changes in the last um months what i was wondering um um, when I read uh, about you and your company and uh, what you build and how you sold it to Atai Life Science and what you're building now. Um, I mean, mental health is, is not a new problem. And they always thought there are enough solutions on the market already, uh, antidepressants, for example. Uh, what's the situation? Why, why is it necessary to develop something new, in your opinion? Oh, well, Christian, uh, the... the uh, I, I I'm old and I started, you know, practicing psychiatry, um, you know, when uh, the, uh, you know, uh, SSRIs um, had, you know, like Prozac, uh, mm -hmm. they had just come on the market. And, you know, back then, this was a really big deal um, because before that, all we had were, were drugs like tricyclic antidepressants, which was a little bit like taking a depressed suicidal person and handing them a gun. 
because these drugs were if you took a if you took an overdose of them they were quite deadly and um so it, it and, and they also had a lot of side effects and they and their you know sort of spectrum of activity was was fairly limited so they they uh, you know you you ended up treating people with uh, either underdosing them or if you gave them full dose they had a lot of side effects and so it was really hard to unless you were pretty sick and so the SSRIs allowed this sort of uh, to that allowed a much broader population of people who were uh, had mood anxiety uh, symptoms obsessive compulsive disorder was another one where we really had no treatments and the SSRIs at least were partially successful in treating um, uh, obsessions and compulsions, which is you know a pretty common disorder in the in the world. Um, so that was a really big deal back then and um, changed psychiatry uh, substantially um, and may, you know maybe maybe as big a deal as the um, antipsychotics in the 1950s uh, being developed, which you know de deinstitutionalized a lot of a lot of uh, people with psychotic disorders. Um, so but that was, you know, we're talking the 1980s. Right. And um, with minor variations on a theme, there really haven't been um, new mechanisms of action for the most part um, uh, that. Um, so these are all drugs that are, you know, what you know what are called monoamine based drugs and, and increasing serotonin or some of these other monoamines and and um and so nothing techno so so this is an area ripe for you know sort of uh uh new technologies because you know that's what you know like you know going on 50 years without uh a, me a new mechanism of action for um antidepressants um being uh, uh, developed or, and some of these allied neuropsychiatric disorders. So, um, so, you know, that those, the, the, those drugs are, are effective, but they're, as you know, not effective for, um, a big chunk of the population. And, you know, the psychiatrists then end up with people on 10 different drugs or five different drugs, um, switching from one drug to the other, adding one to the other, um, and and often people feel stuck on these drugs where they're better, maybe in some cases to a certain degree, but they feel like they're not really completely well, uh, but they're also afraid to stop taking them. Um, and, you know, the side effects are, are, are things that are common, like uh, sexual dysfunction, and some people get weight loss or get restlessness or what's called akathisia from them. So, so there's a host of issues with these drugs uh, in addition to their taking a long time to work. Um, you know, they don't work immediately. Um, so so the, the, there really is a, um, a, a sense that, um, and, and uh, that they're, they're also sort of band-aids, you know, they, they, and, and people often feel, they don't feel depressed, but they don't necessarily feel fully emotionally there, so that's kind of a, a maybe a slight blunting of affect uh, with some of these drugs. So I don't mean uh, you know there, it's it's easy really to sort of trash these drugs, you know the existing drugs, um, but you know for some people they're tremendously effective. Um, and um, but what I noticed as a psychiatrist was that you know back when I practiced medicine, which was a while ago, but you know I could probably pick up uh, and do that again because given this lack of of advancement in the field uh, without having to learn very much new. Um, but when I, I, you know, I, I would be, it would be like, great when you'd see those, those people who got tremendously better on the existing drugs, you were, you know, it was very exciting. Um, and, um, but it was, it, it, it almost seemed as if it was the exception where you had that very crisp, like that's the right drug for that person. So there's a tremendous need now, um, you know, given what we've been talking about and, you know, just, just for example, with post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, all these, all the people that have had tra trauma from wars and COVID and uh, early life traumas, what, whatever it is, um, you know, that the, uh, there, there are behavioral therapies that work to some degree. And then the drugs like the SSRIs are 
you know, you can get them approved uh, to some degree, you know, from 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 doing big trials. But, you know, you have to do very large trials just to see a difference from placebo. So 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 the 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 effect and, and, and now what we're seeing, you know, as an example um, is that um, the nonprofit group maps um, that Rick Doblin runs, you know, has been doing work with um, uh, MDMA, which is a, a very old drug. Um, it was, uh, uh, back to I think it's probably the uh, the drug the, the the drug was actually first made in like nineteen like fifteen or something, and so long um, ago. a r- really long time ago. And then uh, you know uh, there's you know all these sort of stories and these things you know where it was then then of course the CIA always gets involved when there's any cool psychotropic thing. So you know uh, so they were trying to test it in the i don't know 1940s or something as like a truth mm-hmm. series uh and uh but it you know it took then uh the great psychedelic chemist alexander shulgin you know then picked this back up in the 1950s i believe it was or something like that and um and began to uh explore the 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 potential of mdma but that drug mdma uh, you know, in the hands of these MAP trials has, you know, demonstrated in post-traumatic stress disorder, remarkable effectiveness. And these are also fast drugs that work fast. So, and the lesson there is, first of all, that you can get something to work quickly, that it's a drug used with psychotherapy. So it's not the drug itself alone, but it's, it's, uh, um, uh, it's sort of an MDMA is not a classic psychedelic, but it's sort of psychedelic like, but it's, you know, psychedelic, you know, assisted psychotherapy, you know, mm-hmm. that, that, um, and, and, and it's, it's in the, what we think is happening with these drugs is in, in general, is they open neuroplasticity, which is kind of a big term for pretty much your brain changing, you know, the sort of the networks of your brain, uh, you know, our brains are always changing all the time. So neuroplasticity is sort of, you know, the rule, but, but these drugs enhance that capacity for that, for that sort of fluidity and change to occur. So, um, so, so now you, you see in with psychotherapy and MDMA people with PTSD, where a big percentage of them don't meet the diagnosis anymore after mm-hmm. treatment, which is very different than the little improvements we would get with things like SSRIs and, and behavioral therapy works too, but it's really hard. Um, I don't know, you know, if you've ever tried psychotherapy, but you know, it's very hard, you know, people are very, uh, you know, they're, they tend to be in a groove of how they think and, and feel, and it's hard, very hard to get them out of those deep grooves. And so we, so, so these drugs, you know, sort of allow for, um, mobile in this case with MDMA as an example, mobilization of emotion, mobilization of of connection to other people, which you know, um, as we were talking about with the pandemic, has been you know rather um, uh, diminished. And so these drugs sort of allow people almost immediate access to connectedness and uh, their emotional world. Um, that then you know is sort of a ca- it's like a catalyst in a, in a chemistry experiment. It's, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, when I try to remember my experience with psychedelic drugs, it's mostly the experience from um, articles in the newspaper where um, I read that uh, this and that music star tried psychedelic drugs and uh, sometimes had not so, so great experiences. Um, is that really such a potent uh, um um, a drug that you can change people immediately, as you say. Um, well, look, I think that, and this goes back to your question about about my friend Christian Angermeyer and his hundred uh, percent. Everybody's mentally ill, um, uh, which does sound like Christian, but he also does have a good sense of humor. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, I think uh, that you know that. Uh, We're, 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 we don't want to over uh, sell the, these things. Um, we don't want, you know, the problem with a lot of things is they get hyped to the, to, to, to the moon. 
And, and that is detrimental. So, you know, psychedelic drugs, you know, historically and back to the, uh, you know, the, the days of the hippies and the, the you know, of, uh, of uh, Kesey and, uh, you know, Ram Dass and, uh, and, and all of these things. You know, I think the, I remember. I think Jim Morrison wrote some songs uh, while he was using psychedelic drugs, and I think also Jimi Hendrix yeah. uh, used oh, that. Well, the, the, the Doors, uh, it, it, the name "The Doors" is is from uh, Aldous Huxley's book "The Doors of Perception" mm -hmm. about uh, you know him tripping on mescaline. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, oh, so I think that the, the we don't want to we. We don't want to. What we want to, I think, portray these drugs as is as uh, as as um, uh, um, sort of uh, you know. It's like uh, you're a scientist, and now you have a microscope. Now you know if you if I give you a microscope, you know, depending on your 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 uh, talent in science, you you may or may not you know uh, uh, make great discoveries, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and depending on who's helping you to teaching you about, you know, cells and, and microscopes, you know, et cetera. So, so the microscope obviously has had, had, you know, uh, you know, it was sort of like the telescope for astronomy, you know, and, um, and people have sort of, uh, suggested that, you know, psychedelics are sort of the equivalent of the microscope or the telescope, uh, uh, for psychiatry. That's, that's, uh, a great metaphor when when did you get the inspiration in your life that um i mean on one hand you said something needs to change and on the other hand you started doing research with psychedelic drugs what what inspired you what lit the spark in you to go down that route yeah well it, it it's a complicated sort of you know as, as you might imagine you know uh meandering tale but uh it it uh And, and, and Christian Angermeyer gets a little bit of credit there uh, for being a, a great, uh, you know, kind of enthusiast for this whole area. But I, I had been, I mean, you know, just uh, for full disclosure, you know, back in my wayward youth, I had, uh, you know, been a, a student at Duke University and I had uh, experienced uh, uh, drinking uh, 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 mushroom tea with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. and And I, I remember it like a, to this day, like a flash, you know, the sort of flash memories that, that, you know, were of something very significant that you, that, that, uh, you don't ever forget. And, um, and it, 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 uh, it really sort of opened me to sort of thinking about the mind and thinking about psychology and thinking about human development and kind of, um, more sort of mystical and spiritual sort of topics and, and this sort of thing. And, and I think th then because of that, I, I became a student of this, the, this, uh, great mystic philosopher, G.I. Gurdjieff. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, and, and then, and then that, but I, I think in the end, all of that led me to, uh, have people who, uh, I interacted with and said, you'd be a good psychiatrist. And, and I, I was like, I would. And, you know, I, I, I and, uh, you know, I was in medical school at the time and wasn't really necessarily obvious to me that, that that was the most interesting thing to do. I mean, psychiatry was sort of, is still sort of a field that, you know, where we don't really understand all that much about the organ of interest, you know, the brain. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, uh, but, but I, so I think I saw that how these drugs could have such a powerful effect on um, this, on the sort of direction of one's thought and the direction of one's life and kind of being able to sort of, you know, I remember being able to watch myself from above, you know, watch, watching my behavior as if I, as if I was, it was a movie camera and I was being, and I was watching myself on TV. Yeah, this uh, is what this is. This is one of the exercises uh, that people get when they do coaching education. So when they get a uh, training in coaching, that uh, you should get outside of yourself and uh, observe your own behavior. And yeah. with these tracks, it's possible. Yeah, and and so 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 I think there's a lot of self observation that is possible, and that's why it's very important. Um, and, you know, you 
you know, you, you've heard this term, you know, you want to take psychedelic drugs, but you want to have to be, you want to have a good trip, mm -hmm. you know, you want to have a bad trip. Right. And although in some ways, I think those, that's a very binary way of thinking about it because some of the things that happen in these sort of psychedelic trips can be difficult uh, or painful in some ways, but it, it, it but it, it can then be in the service of, of looking at and exploring things. Um, and, um, so in any event, I mean, I, that, that I think is, is, is very important, but I think what happened to me was that I, I, because of all this, um, I, I remember that I would sit, I, I went to medical school in Miami mm -hmm. and I would sit in the jacuzzi in coconut Grove. And, and, uh, there was this woman, I was dating her daughter and she, but she was this sort of famous professor of psychiatry at Harvard, and she had retired down to Miami. And we would sit in the jacuzzi, uh, not with the daughter, strangely, with the mother, and, and the mother would give me articles to read in psychiatry. And then we would discuss them. And then she said, you'd be a good psychiatrist. And she sent me to Boston, which is, I guess probably now or at the time anyway, was sort of like the place to go to train, you know, had the, had the, the most intellectual you know, kind of atmosphere for psychiatry. Um, so, so, so I think that that was sort of like in the, so then, you know, I went on to do psychiatry and I ran a department and did research and all these things, but it was in the back of my mind that, uh, you know, this experience. And then I, I got interested in, um, I was, you know, I, I, I was interested in what's kind of referred to as the sort of glutamatergic theory of of mood disorders which glutamate is this uh um um that sort of the main uh excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain and um and i got very interested in that this was an alternative way to look at um depression and in fact psychedelic drugs influence this glutamatergic balance we now suspect and um, but at the time, it was just more my interest in this. And I and I I and I was very interested in manic depression. I, I was always fascinated by the fact that people could be, you know, go from this tremendous euphoria and almost superhuman capabilities and then dive into into the most you know bleak suicidal depressions, um, you know, within a short time and then back. Did you did, did you I mean, uh, you said that. Uh... It, it, it's it's very interesting to you this area this um this is it bipolar disorder some 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 very have euphoria and then just fall down uh, some sort of rabbit hole and uh, end up in a very dark place. But what's the reason why that happens in people? Do you, what's what's your what's your opinion on that? Well, you know why people have these cyclic you know mood disorders as they're called um, is you know we don't. And that's part of the problem with a lot of these things is we 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 really don't know. Um, we we know that there are certain things that are extremely helpful uh, to them. For example, lithium, mm -hmm. uh, which again, you know, in psychiatry, sadly, was you know dis discovered complete completely serendipitously and sort of like the logic of it makes no sense. But it doesn't matter. Somebody you know, Cade and these guys figured it out. You know, but it was really because it sedated rodents, you know, when they were using it as a solvent. So, uh, but, but, uh, but we don't really know, uh, the, the, the cause of it, but, uh, it's clear that people can go from, you know, when they're hypomanic is when, you know, say writers and artists that have a predilection often to these things, it's, you know, it's when they're, they're, they're most productive, you know, they, It's when, you know, Tchaikovsky's writing all this great music and et cetera. You know, the, the people have uh, the most remarkable capabilities. And so if you think about it, it's a little bit like uh, there, there's an analogy there to psychedelic drugs in a way, you know, that, that people can be in a state where they, they're, they're able, to, where their mental flexibility, their neuroplasticity is enhanced and they're able to learn things and to understand things and to create things um, at an astounding pace. And the problem is then they go from that, what's that, that state, which is called hypomania to full mania. And in full mania, then it becomes a quite uh, dangerous and dysfunctional state where people, you know, are delusional sometimes and um, uh, danger to 
themselves and destroy things. And are, it's, you know, quite, uh, uh, and become psychotic and end up in the hospital and it's very dangerous. Um, and then equally so then they crash into these depressions. Um, but we don't, the, the, we really don't know the answer as to why those things occur. So, but, you know, back to your question, I mean, I, I, I so this, I, flew, I, so I started to flow into just learning about the glutamate, glutamate system and people were, you know, was a, a, people at the NIH were also very kind and sort of open and like, you know, it was sort of this wor wonderful world where people were like, come into my lab, let, let, you know, of course, you know, the lab chief picks up the phone and himself and discusses things with you, you know, at the spur of the moment. Uh, so I really, I really like that. And I, I, I like the intellectual, it, you know, I was, I was a little, uh, after a while, a little bored with the limitations of just practicing psychiatry. It seemed kind of mm -hmm. like useful and helpful to me, but sort of not enough. So, so I, 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 I ended up writing a paper on, on a new drug for manic depression uh, called the Motrogene or Lamictal, um, and um, and uh, and then uh, and then at some point, um, I, my 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 wife got recruited to the to the NIH to the labs at NIH. So I was kind of coming along. At, I had to get a job, or they wouldn't accept her because they you know they so I had I had like cold call cold call everybody at all the lab chiefs at the NIH till I got a job on within ten days. So I got a job and, uh, and I went there and then I had this tremendous time learning because, you know, money was no object as long as you had good ideas, it was Same. fun and it was just fun. And, and I learned a tremendous amount. So, uh, you know, but then I ended up going off to industry to, to Jane Jay and, uh, we're, we're after why, I, why yeah. let me just interrupt a little bit. I, I would like to understand it better. Why did you decide to go to the industry? Um, you were in, the, in a perfect research situation. Yeah, you know what? It, 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 it was partly because it was, it was very, uh, it, the NIH was this tremendously rich research environment, but for doing clinical research, it was quite limited. Um, mm -hmm. You, you know, you, it was just very, uh, it was very slow and difficult to recruit subjects. And um, it was, uh, you know, just, you know, some of the bureaucracies of the government and, and it, 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 it was, I, I felt sort of impatient uh, there and with, with the pace of things and, um, and felt also like the NIH didn't make drugs. They didn't design molecules, you know? So, so you were then dependent on like the pharma companies to partner with you to study something. And so, uh, which we did quite a bit of, but it felt as if like, well, I really want to be involved at the level where we're designing new molecules and making new things and where we have resources to do it quickly. And that was definitely not the NIH, despite how much I learned there and, and how much I liked it. Um, it, it, it was, it was, a, a little bureaucratic and slow. So, um, so, and, and also I got into a little bit of, of a difficulty where I, I made the mistake of being, I think, too honest. And, and some reporter called me from the New York times and asked me about this, uh, study I had, uh, I had, uh, uh, presented at a meeting and it was a very boring study. It was completely negative study. So I, I really wasn't really thinking too much about it, but what I, it ended up in the newspapers because the, I didn't know this, but the drug company, which at that point was Park Davis was being indicted by the feds uh, for um, illegal marketing of the drug that they asked me about. And so I somehow inadvertently ended up in the middle of this, which was not, nobody was very uh, happy about at the NIH. Uh, and, uh, so, but because of that, somebody saw this in the newspapers and said, well, would you like a job at Johnson and Johnson? And is, so, uh, it, so basically it was good marketing for you <laughs> to, to get I, the I wrong thing, but somehow it like ended up, uh, you know, good, good for me. <laughs> uh, and, um, so, so I, I, I thought about it and I was like, huh, Johnson and Johnson, that's kind of, and I went and often interviewed there and, and I, I said, you know, realized I could learn a tremendous amount 
about drug development from these people because that's you know, that thing. And and it was also very John Chain J was a great place to start. It was like very kind of I don't know almost like the 1950s or something. It was just very uh, old fashioned and people they they really took care of their employees and it just felt it, it would seem kind of like if you had to go somewhere in industry it was a good place to start. So I spent a few years there and um um but but uh in which how, in which in which area did you work back then at change what, what was it also uh, uh yeah the, well I worked for in the psychiatry and the neurology franchises mm -hmm. as they called them. So I was we were developing I you know my first project was a a not was a developing a uh, a novel antidepressant which you know and this is another reason that I also you know for later that one of the lessons i think for me about moving from big pharma to biotech was and this is an example where we did a big study with this drug and it worked but it was not it didn't work as well as as Paxil or paroxetine, which is an SSRI. And so they, so Johnson and Johnson, and had, there were some side effects, but so Johnson just, Johnson decided to kill the whole program. But, but I had patented, but from the data, I had patented a new use for this drug uh, for uh, sleep wake uh, disorders and, uh, and, and, um, and it, cause it had this like, uh, oh, awakening stimulating property um and so um so they johnson and johnson just gave it back to uh uh sk corporation of korea where they had they had licensed it from um but they took sk corporation uh, they took that patent that i had filed um which they then owned And they made that into uh, a drug for sleep-wake disorders, which is now on the market uh, uh, and sold by Jazz Pharmaceuticals. And as you know, I, I you know, it's like a billion-dollar uh, drug, most likely at some at some point. So, so it so it struck me that that was another example where I, I, another learning uh, lesson for me, which was that you know that this sort of like the NIH, this was a, you know, J and J, you know, was a, a, a you know, a, a large bureaucracy. And, um, uh, and uh, so. The larger uh, the comp, the larger the organizations, the more bureaucracy you get on the table, I guess. Yeah, and, and, and sort of a rigidity in decision-making and a lack of sort of creativity. And I was just like, this is terrible. Uh, as much as I also like J and J. Um, and, and I think, by the way, the same thing, there's another, you know, kind of a follow up to that, which was that, you know, later, well, my, a lot of the people I worked with at NIH, uh, like Hussaini Manji and, and such, they all like left NIH and they all came to J&J, but they came as I left. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they developed esketamine or Spravato, as it's called, which is the first of these, you know, new rapid acting antidepressants, you know, the as I kind of said, this glutamatergic antidepressants, this was the first one, first drug approved. And um, so that is kind of, in, it was sort of interesting because later when I uh, left uh, uh, Pfizer, I, I, I decided to, that I wanted to develop essentially the mirror image of what J&J &J was doing, or you know, they were developing what's called S-ketamine. And I decided that they, they made the wrong call and 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 our ketamine was actually the better drug for psychiatry which j and j was not too happy about what's the difference between these these two well they're they're stereo isomers so uh you know so they're you know the the equivalent of you know the, the of your left hand and your right hand you know they're they're the same but they're different right you know you, you you can't put your 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 right glove on your left hand but your hands are the same so they go to the dark side, the Jedi, and the uh, what's the other side in the in the in Star Wars? Yeah, 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 so something like that. So uh, the, yeah, the uh, um, the light or the you know. Uh, uh, so so the um, the yeah. So 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 uh, so I think that's another example where you know they they decided we were developing S ketamine and that's the answer and 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 they surprisingly left on the table what we think is the better mm. ice 
compound to develop for psychiatry. S-ketamine is better for anesthesia, I think, uh, uh, where it's used in, around the world. Uh, but our ketamine looks like it's the better drug for psychiatry because that different that stereochemistry creates different physical chemical properties, you know, because drugs are binding in receptors that have three dimensional, uh, you know, uh, uh, configurations. So, um, so, so, so that's another example where you know the the, the, the there's a problem of in terms of innovation. Um, at these big organizations. And so, so I, I left there and went to Pfizer and, you know, but along the way, then you learn how to run big projects and you learn how to, you know, you learn a tremendous amount from the, these organizations are very, you know, resource rich. Um, and so, um, so I, I, I left Jane Jay, my wife got a job at a uh, professorship at Columbia. So I left there, left uh, Jane Jay moved to Pfizer, but uh, it, eventually it was the same sort of story where you know Pfizer also you know was very bureaucratic and very political and uh, um, and um, uh, and uh, you know was spending a tremendous amount of money um, and uh, getting I don't I didn't think a whole lot out of their research efforts at least in psychiatry um, and. Um, and they figured that out finally and decided to leave. But, uh, well, one more question for my end. Uh, you mentioned yeah, yeah. Pfizer. In these days, Pfizer, Pfizer did, did uh, still uh, allocate large budgets to early stage research. I always, I mean, when I now look on the pharma industry, it looks to me that uh, all these big corporations focus more on marketing drugs and uh, getting the regulatory approval processes done and do the large uh, scale phase three trials but not the earlier stages. But in these days, uh, Pfizer was also, and J&J &J were also involved in early stage research. Yeah, no, I mean, I think they're always doing early stage research at all these big companies, but they, they, they oftentimes, I think, don't end up being uh, the, the best at, at doing that early stage research. And I think- what? That What, what's, what's your opinion? Why, why is that? Why is early stage research better in small companies than big corporations? I, um, I think it's the, I mean, I think if you, you study the culture of a biotech and then study the culture of a big uh, pharmaceutical company, um, there's a... Um, a passion and a focus and an energy and a um, scrappiness and a uh, uh, being able to make decisions. You know, at, at Pfizer, all decisions were political and took forever, you know, and at a biotech, the decision is made because somebody calls me, you know, mm -hmm. and that's it. You know, so the, 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 you know, uh, and, and, and of course most biotechs will fail. Uh, but there'll be enough of them to succeed. And when they do, you know, they, they tend to often be, uh, you know, um, quite, so, so it's not entirely the case. I mean, there have been plenty of drugs, of course, being de developed by big companies, but it's often this cultural issue. So if you look at like when the statins first got developed, you know, Merck um, uh, 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 developed the first uh, statin. And, but at the time, uh, you know, uh, Uh, Roy Vagelos could come from from St. Louis, and it, you know, Merck was up, was you know not doing all that well, and you know he kind of pulled up some dejected chemists from the basement and started drawing things on the blackboards and and had a, a vision, you know, and a passion for like this is how we're going to create the next drug for cardiovascular disorders, and and the science had was ripe for that. And he had, you know, so he brought that excitement and vision and, 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 you know, to, to Merck, um, and, um, and that, but of course, in the end, Pfizer, you know, then marketed Lipitor, which became even a bigger drug. Um, so, um, the, the, the first horse, uh, it doesn't always, uh, win, you know, that starts the first horse out of the gate doesn't win the race necessarily, but, uh, uh, but, uh, Uh, but 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 I think again that sort of even that in that case where Merck was a big company, it was that you know, Vagelos coming and creating that excitement 
and energy and, you know, kind of new blood, new, new vision and blood and sort of leadership, you know, the kind of, and, and that, that's it. And, and, you know, big companies, it just tends to become sort of mechanical and somewhat bureaucratic. And you're always sort of fighting up against the commercial people and the, you know, uh, and, the, you know, they have strategies that they develop that, you know, only allows you to do this and this, even though you kind of aware, like, it'd be better if you didn't do that, but well, but that doesn't, you know, it, we don't, we're not interested in anything unless it has nine zeros after it, you know, the sort of thing where smaller, smaller companies don't think that way. So I, I think that sort of combination of things. I think there is, um, it's like, um, it's like at the army, you need, sometimes you need troops and sometimes, uh, for some tasks, special forces are just better at smaller groups and, yeah. um, they're much quicker. And it's, I think it's the same with small biotechs and large pharma. So some tasks, especially at the early stage development is better allocated in small biotechs and because they're faster decision-making processes, more passion, uh, getting things done, um, moving forward. And when I think, for example, at, uh, mRNA vaccines, I mean, it's one, one of the recent examples um biontech and pfizer i mean once uh drugs really need to be spun out uh or pushed at scale to patients i think the large pharma troops are the best solution for that I mean, just imagine a small biotech building then sales forces uh would next to be impossible so i think there is a uh, good and good and bad sides in both worlds Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, well, big pharma was, it was it, in some ways it was great for me because I, you know, first of all, I, I steal all their people and, uh, and also it just really, uh, you know, gave me a background, uh, you know, in, in so many things, it was like a, you know, uh, like a, a you know, a 10 year training program or something. I mean, you had, you had everything. You had a university background in psychiatry. Then you went to NIH for, for research, doing research, and then uh, the big pharma background. Uh, and then, I mean, from what you were saying, the logical decision then was to found your own company. When did that happen? When did you make the decision the first time that you say, okay, let's uh, let's uh, start something on my own? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I was the clinical disease uh, area expert in at Pfizer for you know, neuroscience and, you know, in the psychiatry area. And so I, you know, at, and I could see things kind of going downhill in terms of Pfizer's interest in psychiatry. And, uh, they, they, they weren't, they, they really didn't, you know, put much effort into that. And, um, and, and I, and I realized that they were going to leave neuroscience. So I had to figure out, well, what, what do you want to do next? You know, and, um, and I tend to be a little restless. I don't want to do the same thing and I, I don't want to do something bureaucratic and repetitive. So, um, and, um, and then I went to a meeting of, of the American college of neuropsychopharmacology, the, the ACNP, which is this very elite organization that has a meeting every year. And I, um, and I heard a, a talk, uh, talks on, the whole, the, you know, this whole glutamatergic ketamine space, which I had sort of been out of, you know, for many years. And I was trying to make sense of the whole thing. And there was a lot of contradictory data and it was unclear what was going on. And then this guy um, named Kenji Hashimoto from Chiba University, mm -hmm. Japan, gave a talk on our ketamine. And, and, and as I listened to this talk, I was like, I, it sort of came to my mind that this may be he may be right and and it, and and nobody seems to be quite registering that and and i think that's that's that that happens quite a bit too you know there's sort of every, everybody's kind of going down you know the orthodox some orthodox route you know and and then and 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 he kind of came with this idea that and and and, and, that, and also there wasn't a strong understanding like well why you know our ketamine is weaker uh, is is a uh, it has weaker binding to its receptor, which is the NMDA receptor. So why would you pick the weaker isomer if you you know if you have a choice? You know why would that be better? That doesn't make any sense. But I sort of realized like we don't really the NMDA receptor is very complex and it ha has variations across the brain and subunit uh, composition. So it, there was a lot we didn't know. And so it was sort of an empiric, my, my empirical sense was like, this may be right. And so I met with them and, um, and I, 
brought my uh, my 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 old boss from Pfizer into the picture, Jake Kranzler, who had a lot of biotech experience, and we sort of negotiated with uh, the university to license our ketamine, and that we decided we would we would develop that as a drug. And you know, we had a little trouble because of the fact that uh, people were like incredulous because they were like, well. You can't be right because Jane J, if you were right, Jane J would have been all over this, you know, because they're like this giant company with all of these, you know, intelligence people and thousands of scientists. Like, how how could it be that they're like you just come along, you just as a person and and do this? And so people were not, they didn't really and Jane J was also very, you know, very defensive about this because of course if I was right, they would they looked not too great. Uh, um, so, uh, so there was a lot of internal, you know, kind of anger at, from the Jane J people at our, my old NIH colleagues who, and, and, and what happened was that there was a, uh, my old colleagues at NIH, uh, Carlos Zarati and company, um, and Todd Gould, uh, they published a paper in nature, uh, that essentially said that, uh, the what's really going on is that there's a metabolite of R ketamine of the R isomer called 2R 6R hydroxynorketamine, mm-hmm. and it's that metabolite that actually is the um, the anti de- what what causes this antidepressant effect, and so it wasn't clear that they were right, but they replicated this R ketamine data. But the but the NIH then said, well, we'll license to a company this metabolite because they had patented it, and so all the companies went scurrying off to try to patent uh, to sort of to try to license this uh, patented uh, metabolite, and this left our ketamine and the Japanese like sitting there and nobody was interested. So this so I was able to write them a check. And um, you know, for for a very small amount of money, license in the uh, the uh, the compound and start to develop the program, um, and and so um, so so I uh, so this then so this they, this did they get it right? This was the f- uh, foundation basically of perception or neuroscience, yeah, your first right. company, right? And this was you know, in perception, you know, Jim Morrison had the doors as from the doors of perception. I took the the doors of perception perception. <laughs> And, uh, and so, uh, we started, yeah, so I started perception and, um, and perception neuroscience, uh, you know, we start and we started to, to get the trials planned and preclinical work going. Um, and then, uh, as we were doing that, uh, you know, we needed to raise money, uh, and a couple of different folks came along, including Christian Engermeyer. Uh, and who was now enamored with psilocybin and psychedelics and wanted to build like the bridge bio or Roy Vant kind of model and mm-hmm. things. And, and, and he was very, him and George Goldsmith, who runs Compass, they were very intent on doing a deal to, uh, uh, to buy a, a controlling share in, in perception. Uh, and so uh, so I negotiated a deal with them, uh, and, uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, perception got funded and, you know, moved forward. So that's how that, and, and now it's in phase two, uh, development, um, uh, you know, uh, which is, you know, uh, happening in the U S and, and Europe. I mean, it's, you know. it's, it's, it's a big success. I mean, given that, uh, I would say 99 out of hundred early stage biotech failed. And don't move forward. So basically, your company moved up to clinical phase two already with with the compounds. It's really congratulations. Yeah, I, I, it's great success. Right. Yeah, thanks. No, I, and now 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 the uh, we have to you know I think I think it's uh, you know there's a very high probability of success for that compound. Um, uh, you know, given the data, and uh, I you know I think well, it'd be very surprising if it doesn't work. Um, which 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 indication? Does a time focus with your uh, compounds now? It, uh, it's being developed uh, for treatment resistant depression. Uh, mm. so, and I think it could, you know, would be effective for pretty much any kind of depression or or an anxiety disorder uh, and 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 substance abuse disorders too. Mm. 
So, so it has a pretty broad spectrum of activity, and there's That's very nice. strong, strong intellectual property. So it's 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 a pretty good uh, program, um, and um, and and now, uh, ironically, they brought people from Johnson and Johnson in <laughs> to run it. So the the circle is closed now. So it's basically yeah. Johnson Johnson back. No, back, no, back no, to Johnson, <laughs> Johnson who were like screaming at them, like, why aren't you why aren't you talking to Sporn about licensing Arketamine? And they were like, shut up, don't don't ever <laughs> That's a, that's a funny part of the story. Let me ask you one question. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, usually here in Austria or in Europe, uh, the dream of uh, scientists who got the entrepreneurial spark, found a company, sell a company, um, and the dream usually ends with uh, they live happily ever after on the islands with 10 Teslas and uh, nice houses and just retire and enjoy life. Uh, you decided to found another company. Why? <laughs> why, why did you uh, say there is something that needs to be done? Christian's right. Mental health problems are 100%. You see? Mm. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I, um, I mean, I, I don't see what I do generally as work. So I like, I like, it's just, it's extremely interesting and fun. So like, I, I, I think, you know, I don't know what I would, you know, do on the Island after I drove the Tesla <laughs> around three times, you know? Uh, so, uh, uh, And so uh, I think that so what you know I mean honestly what happened was I I I I stayed on at Perception as the chief scientific officer, but it just felt didn't feel like the right fit for me. I I I, I you know unless they were going to really take Perception and make it into a itself into a larger enterprise, but you know it was really a single product company. Um, and so my, the, the best use of my ability wasn't really running, you know, those early stage, you know, projects, um, you know, for that one molecule, um, at that point. So I think I, 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 so I, I didn't stay that long there after that. And then I, I had through, you know, sort of again, back to my Johnson and Johnson roots, one of my close friends, was the head of sort of licensing stuff for Johnson and Johnson for neuroscience. And uh, he brought me to his lake house north of New York with an, in, with this young uh, uh, medicinal chemist who, and, 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 and he brought me because the chemist was interested in um, a molecule called tyoneptine, which is an antidepressant in Europe. It doesn't exist in the U S mm -hmm. Um, and, um, it was a Servier molecule and, and he was making new, uh, salts or new, new, uh, or, uh, some new, uh, forms of tyoneptine. And, um, and so, and, 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 they, and this guy knew that at J and J, I had been instrumental in getting J and J to make new salts of tyoneptine and try, had tried to get them to develop it, um, to no avail. They, They, they 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 started a they were going to start a company to do it and then they lost interest somehow along the way another big company story and um, so they brought me to meet him and then we stayed in touch and then when I realized that I was going to leave perception I called him up and said we're starting a company and um, and uh, and he had already also started a company that he also now has sold to, to a tie to Christians folks. And uh, called Cures with a K, and uh, so I said we're going to start a company and we're going to do what I think is not, was not being done in the psychedelic space, which was to develop to develop novel drugs with IP on the chemical matter um, that were going to really innovate the space as opposed to psilocybin is a great drug so why don't we develop it even though it's a generic drug or mma is a great drug but it's a generic drug there's not much innovation there there's just you know pushing things through the system and then of course you know pharma is not interested in those things because they can't protect them for their investment um so um so i had this vision that we would take what we both what we knew scientifically also I realized that these chemists were really into psychedelics. And so they knew every compound 
that had been made and tried by people anecdotally. So like the great chemist Sasha Shulgin, who you know used to work with the DEA, and then they 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 uh, and then he published uh, his uh, books, his sort of uh, kind of recipe books on how to make psychedelics, and they uh, you know parted ways with him. Uh, but uh, he he had made you know changed atom atom you know uh, 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 by atom these uh, psychedelic drugs and then tried almost tried hundreds of them himself. Um, and so uh, he was sort of the you know the the, the the great sort of father of the psychedelic you know you know chemistry area. And so they knew every single molecule that Shostakovich and what he had said about them, and and also you know there's on the web there's so many people with trip reports reporting on their you know all these psychonauts reporting on their experience with psychedelic drugs. So I realized these guys knew everything about this and. Mm-hmm. And and they were also really good academic, you know, experienced chemists. And 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 Andrew Krugel, my partner, was you know very uh, entrepreneurial. So uh, so I said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take molecules of different kinds, and we're going to then look at them, and then we're going to say what could be better. And so as an example, even though our ketamine is this drug, and I think is you know making great progress, we were like, well. It's good, but if it was a pill, it would be even better. So can we design a molecule that will have, you know, will, where the properties of, of it will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, commensurate with our ketamine, but it's a new molecule and it's different because it's a pill. Uh, because ketamine you can't uh, really use very readily as a pill because your liver chops it up uh, fast in a, in a variable way. So it, it, you know, it's the first, first pass metabolism problem. So, uh, so that's an example where we realize, like, you know, we, we can likely do that fairly easily. Um, and, um, and, and, but, and but given you have the right team. So I think, uh, it's not, it's uh, not chemistry is not that easy. <laughs> oh, no, right. But, it, but, but, uh, for the right chemists with the right ideas, it wasn't mm. that hard. And and it was like it and 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 what was interesting was that in the space all the people interested in ketamine were mostly clinicians and not chemists. So they were looking at ketamine, our ketamine, metabolites, but they weren't thinking about making new molecules. Um, uh, they didn't know how to do that. Uh, and 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 uh, and this is and this really hadn't caught the attention yet of too much of uh, big pharma and. Um, Jane Jay was already pot committed with s ketamine. Uh, so we realized we could do that. And then we we just went down the line. We were like, okay, well, uh, you know, for example, DMT, which is, you know, one of the active components of ayahuasca, you know, which is this, you know, Peruvian, uh, uh, you know, concoction that people make that are, that's very psychedelic, but people vape DMT, but it's very, it only lasts about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Um, and so we thought, well, DMT is a great drug, but it's so fast, it's so short acting. We weren't sure that that was long enough to really be fully therapeutic. And on the other hand, things like psilocybin or LSD last, you know, four, six, eight hours. And that's really hard on, you know, our healthcare system, right? Like how do you, you know, have people sitting around for six hours in your clinic, you know? Uh, so, um, so we decided that what we'd like is a molecule that maybe lasted that was like DMT, but lasted about an hour, and and also DMT has some serotonin releasing properties, which is partly what MDMA does. So mm. it be this sort of warm, emotional, connected feeling. So we realized that we could have a molecule that it was a little bit like psilocybin, but also a little bit like MDMA, and lasted about an hour. So we designed a molecule with those properties. Um, and, um, and that, uh, and that's another example where now we, we think that that will, it's a hypothesis that that will have about the right, uh, you know, characteristics, uh, therapeutically for, you know, uh, neuropsychiatric kind of conditions. Um, and, and this, this has sort of been now an iterative process that there's this tremendous amount of this stuff going on in the company. You know, another example is we, we thought, well, you know, people love microdosing, 
But the problem with microdosing is, you know, you're taking, say, a tenth or two tenths of a dose of a psych of a full psychedelic dose of, say, LSD. But the problem is, is that, you know, you don't want to send your grandmother home with a big bottle of LSD and tell her to take one because she might, depending on the grandmother, take more than that. And um, and so, you know, and then and that so, so it's not it, it has problems as a take home medicine because of the potential uh, for it to be, uh, you know, abused or not adhered to uh, dose wise. So, uh, so did, did, did I understand you right? So the current yeah. uh, treatment regimen is that people go to the clinic and uh, get the dosing then um, under observation of a clinician of a doctor or nurse. So it's uh, not for take home uses what's currently in development okay. and close to market. Okay. Right, like MDMA and psilocybin and LSD and all these things are being generally developed for use in a supervised setting. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 uh, uh, so uh, we what we wanted to do was say like, well, if you could if you had a microdose, but you knew that people couldn't take couldn't get a whole psychedelic trip out of it, it would be it might be an ideal drug for mood and anxiety symptoms. And you see, this is all very anecdotal and not uh, demonstrated in controlled fashion, but there are, I, there are so many thousands of people that are microdosing these drugs to treat mood and anxiety symptoms. Uh, you know, and, and also they seem to enhance creativity and mental flexibility uh, for people. So, um, so what we wanted to do then was to develop uh, a drug that these drugs hit what's you know called the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor that hits this receptor, but does so in a way where it, it sort of has a ceiling effect. So, so even if you take a lot of it, it's not gonna be very psychedelic. You know, be minimally psychedelic even if someone takes more of it than they're prescribed. So we wanted to create, a, and, 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 and what, it wasn't clear how you would do that exactly, but this was again an example where there were case reports of people making new psychedelic drugs where they weren't all that psychedelic. And you can test this to some degree in rodents by the, 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 their heads twitch when they're having when they're tripping. They they have this sort of characteristic, very fast twitching of their head and ears. And so uh so we could we, so we could we, so we would saw, see we saw these reports. And we were able to bring those molecules now into the lab and start to look at them and see what do, do the rodent head twitch experiments confirm what these people are saying uh, from their anecdotal human use that this drug is not, doesn't have a strong psychedelic effect. But, and then the second question becomes, well, maybe that just means it doesn't do a damn thing. Uh, so we wanted to also sh show that it, even though it's not doesn't have powerful uh, psychedelic effects, it's still antidepressant. Mm -hmm. So we were able to then take that into like stress models and such in rodents and show that it it retained the antidepressant effect. But how? How? Um, I, I, one question I'm curious how how do you model that in rodents uh, antidepressant? How can you how can you how can you measure that are, are rodents depressive and uh, yeah, yeah, well, there, there, there's no perfect way, and the models are are not ideal. And in fact, Gilgamesh is is working on, in its platform and creating better methodology there. But there's enough there. You know, sort of the gold standard would be that you take rodents and you stress them for a few weeks mm -hmm. uh, and and mild mild stress you know the the, the bedding's wet or their the light cycle is 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 not right for them you know light light dark cycle um so you can stress them and then when you stress them they stop drinking sugar water as much so that's like a sort of an, a model of what's called anhedonia in humans or or lack of you know sort of in, in, in impaired uh, pleasure response, you know. Uh, um, uh, so, so you can measure this in rodents, and um, and so what you're able to see is when you stress these animals chronically for a few weeks, they stop drinking uh, sweet stuff that, that they like. 
they, they reduce the amount of, of, of sugar water they drink. And you can show then that with antidepressants, it reverses this. Mm. So, so you can you can show that it it it, it protects them against this stress induced um, uh, uh, anhedonia. Um, so, um, so we were able to show then with we we're, we're been able to show them with that we're able to make molecules that are not that psychedelic, but still look like. Of course, you still have to prove that in in humans, obviously, but that looks like it preserves. The antidepressant response, but without the psychedelic. So, if that's the case, if that works, then you have a drug that you know you can go to your uh, local pharmacy and you know pick up a prescription for, and the risks of of that you know being used at home are are, are mild. But we'd still probably want to have some sort of psychotherapy with it. Um, but but it make it really becomes a very different you know becomes much more universally available for treating these conditions. This would, um, be, would be a great thing. This would be a great thing to have more of that on the yeah, market. So that's another example of what Gilgamesh is working on. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're talking to some of our pharma peers that are interested in what we're doing in this respect. Um, so who knows, at some point, we might partner with people on it, on some of these things. Um, and then, and then you know, the other example from our, you know, core portfolio is that there's a very interesting molecule called ibogaine. And uh, and ibogaine is uh, uh, is a compound that comes from a, um, a, a a bush in Africa in in places like Gabon that's used for initiation rituals, uh, and uh, it's a very very powerful psychedelic drug uh, with a it's very long lasting, and it's also dangerous uh, because it can cause uh, cardiac rhythm abnormalities. It it has a QTC prolongation effect. So there are people that have died from uh, uh, from taking ibogaine. Uh, but uh, a uh, some heroin addict in New York um, uh, was given some of this, uh, you know, many uh, decades ago, and he was surprised to find that his uh, craving for heroin completely disappeared. Really? Yeah. And so um, this then, this observation led to a tremendous interest and, and the FDA was involved and the NIDA, the NIH was involved and they were gonna develop it. Um, but because it, you know, the poli you know, as you know, the politics of psychedelic drugs was that the, they're all terrible, you know, uh, this is your mind on drugs, you know, uh, and, um, and so, uh, so, uh, and because also they had this cardiac toxicity risk, uh, this was they were unable to uh, to to develop this. But it was so clearly uh, there were so many clear anecdotes of of ibogaine being um, extremely powerful in one dose to treat heroin addiction or opiate addiction that clinics sprung up in other countries. Like in, like in Mexico, uh, to treat people, you know, sort of the, the rich and famous go to, you know, these Ibogaine clinics and can mm -hmm. and such, you know. And so, uh, but nothing then really happened with it because it's now a generic drug and it's not that safe and this sort of thing. Um, and, uh, but actually a Thai now is developing Ibogaine and or Ibogaine is uh, one of their programs. They have many, many programs. And, um, but what, and, 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 but this is another example of what Gilgamesh is doing is we were like, there's no way in hell we're going to develop a generic drug. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's too expensive it, and, and, and especially a generic drug that's has safety issues. Um, and so what we did was, uh, that, that the, uh, the, the, the labs at Columbia university, which, you know, were you know, kind of uh, uh, partnering with, had spent a decade working on ibogaine uh, chemistry. And they had, you know, meticulously changed one atom after another and looked at how the pharmacology morphed um, with these changes. And, uh, and they were able to find molecules that had very, that were similar to ibogaine, but were tweaked or tuned in terms of 
uh, in this case, for example, being more uh, kappa opiate opiate uh, antagonist activity, but but that's not abuse. Kappa doesn't cause abuse, um, and so they uh, they they uh, th and they realized these drugs were very powerful, and they were novel molecules. And what we've been uh, finding now, and this was not intelligent design. This was just stupid luck. Was that um, some of these molecules that cardiac abnormality, that cardiac risk was tuned out inadvertently. So they That's were safer right. and they were, they looked at least as effective as, as, as Ibogaine. Um, so, so, so Gilgamesh is now moving forward with developing novel analogs of Ibogaine that have this better, uh, therapeutic index. Uh, Did I understand you right? So Gilgamesh mission and vision is to take uh, drugs from the psychedelic space, look at what works already and uh, make the existing uh, approaches in drugs much better. So safer and more effective on the chemist bench. Is that the right uh, perception? You know, we're, we're, that's, that's, that's how we started. We're, we're not, some of them are not exact, you know, and for example, ketamine is, a, it it's not, Classically, it's not a psychedelic drug. It's it's not. They're not five HT two A agonists. Um, so uh, ibogaine is an atypical uh, psychedelic, and we're we're not we're not wed to things being you know psychedelic or, or drugs necessarily. But we we realize that this particular area, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 where, for example, the five HT two A receptor, the NMDA receptor, these were Uh, uh, the cap, cap opioid uh, receptors. These were areas that were ripe for innovation, but we're not. Uh, we, 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 we'll, we'll. And we, we thought that these drug using these targets was safer um, as a starting point because there's already essentially, uh, um, you know, precedent uh, for their precedented targets um, in humans, and so we thought that these drugs will be rapidly effective, powerful drugs that will be, and if we can make them innovate, innovate on them, uh, it's a great starting point. But in the future, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll broaden, broaden that out. But most of the things we're going to be doing will be around these particular targets uh, at this point. And, you know, where we go, from, I mean, you know, that's part of the problem, you know, back to your question about like why, you know, with big pharma, is that you know sometimes big pharma did great things in the sense that they were very innovative and they would go after targets that were uh completely you know where there was really very little information you know and 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 they weren't they certainly weren't like in the old days trying their own drugs uh you know so you know but back in the old days you know uh, when the benzodiazepines were you know created sternberg would you know make ben the first benzos and try it with a soup spoon and uh, tell his wife he won't be home, you know? Uh, uh, so uh, that didn't happen. So, so there were a lot of these programs in big pharma that just in theory, you know, were interesting, but their chances, their probabilities of technical success were small. And we think that in this case, you know, starting with precedented targets, our probability of success is much, you know, much, much larger so, so we think that that's the we think that innovating around these areas is the is the you know kind of the best starting point for the company. So this gives you basically then a <clears throat> composition of meta patents in in this area. I mean, if you remodel the molecules, right? We, we have we, very very strong patent base. Yeah, we, we're 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 basically our philosophy. You know, it's it's a it's a uh, somewhat fraught you know uh, kind of crowded. IP space, but what we've been able to do is to sh is to show on a you know very unexpected results mm -hmm. uh, for these molecules that you know no one skilled in the art would be able to predict, and that's been you know s successful for us. We have for the you know for example for our first two our lead two lead programs we uh, you know we, we've already uh, you know um, uh, you know been successful in and uh, getting uh, the first two uh, patents, uh, uh, you know, now, you know, getting near to be issued. And, you know, so, so those, that, that's worked out uh, perfectly well for us for the first two. And we expect that'll be the Ibogaine ones are even easier. Um, so, 
but yeah, so we're, 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 that's probably one of the big, biggest things with Gilgamesh is we're very good with IP. We're very good with, uh, unknowing, understanding a very complex, uh, intellectual property space. And compared to Perception, your first company, I mean, you said it's a one product company, basically. It's been a one product company purchased by Thai Life Science. Now Gilgamesh uh, has a pipeline. So you're building a pipeline and the vision, I believe, is uh, creating a lasting company with Gilgamesh. Is this the right perception? Uh, yeah, we, 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 you know, we expect to do partnering and licensing deals. Uh, we think that we'll have more substrate than we can actually prosecute ourselves. So we think that there'll be, um, and you know, there'll be a demand for from companies that need pipeline to to work with us. But yes, we want to build not only this machine to the future of the space vis-a-vis -vis, uh, chemistry, uh, which we're I think we're doing a tremendously good job of, but but also then we're 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 putting a small amount of our effort into a uh, platform that is uh, essentially saying like, well. You know, the big the elephant in the room with psychiatry is that you're developing drugs and however good your drugs are, the disorders are not um, carved at, at, the, at biological joints. They're sort of, you know, sort of, you know, you, you, you're, you can meet the definition of depression, you know, umpteen ways, uh, you know, and, and so you're. It's depression, but you, you may have very few symptoms in common with somebody else that has the same uh, 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 disorder uh, 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 syndrome. So that 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 really creates a lot of challenges uh, for drug development. If you know you, you you're trying to make chemicals to target a target, but the disorder is not you know connected necessarily to that particular any particular biology, but as a description. So, so that 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 that's been one of the big big challenges in psychiatry. And so, what we're trying to do at Gilgamesh is to create a platform that will begin to allow us to have um, biomarkers vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, um, electrophysiology. So, we do a lot with EEG uh, signals, um, mm -hmm. and we have in-house uh, uh, capabilities in that regard. Um, and uh, we do that in people and we do that in rodents and we use neuropixels and rodents so we can, you know, uh, interrogate the electrophysiology of individual neurons across the neural axis. And so we're, we're, um, we're, we're trying to create a, a better scientific capability to do all of this stuff um, than head twitches and rodents, which has, you know, been around for, you know, or throwing, throwing them in a tank of water to see how long they swim you know it sounds very almost medieval uh so we we think that that, that that's sort of the will also be i think if we're successful be part of the special sauce of the company in the future as it has this sort of ability to do you know we we do a lot of machine learning of rodent behavior and a lot of machine learning and and electrophysiology work um you know we'll start to you know look at uh natural voice recordings and such in humans, most likely in the near future in, in patients. Uh, so there'll be, a, uh, you know, that'll also be machine learned. So we'll, 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 we'll start to create a way to, in, you know, as a goal to be able to predict what drug a, a particular individual should get based on their history, their biology um, and, uh, and such. And their, you know, their, their, um, and their behavior. Um, so let's stay a little bit with the machine learning. Um, do you have an in-house department, or do, uh, do you partner yeah. up with? Yeah, it's it's we're doing both. We have in we have an in-house uh, uh, data science that that uh, uh, has a lot of expertise. And we we and we then we partner. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have embedded it at at Harvard at uh, Bob Data's lab. Um, Folks uh, uh, helping us with um, running experiments as we speak um, uh, with machine learning of rodent behavior, and uh, uh, Bob's one of the world experts in this. And then at, at NYU, um, at Andre Fenton's lab at NYU, we also have our own like small lab, uh, kind of in, inside his lab, uh, that's doing a lot of the electrophysiology work. And we have some another lab in England uh, that's our uh, the sister lab. The electrophysiology. So, so we have a, a few sort of boutique uh, 
uh, you know, most of what we do at this point is, you know, working with CROs around the world, you know, for efficiency, but we have a few sort of boutique uh, operations that are, um, you know, ex exploring this, uh, you know, kind of this, this uh, uh, you know, trying to create this sort of uh, platform capability. You put an amazing experience to expertise together with your team. I mean, you have uh, the chemistry, you have the early stage drug discovery, drug development expertise, you have the clinical development expertise, uh, the biology, uh, an understanding of uh, psychology, psychiatry from the practical point of view, so from the patient point of view. And then now you start integrating also machine learning, artificial intelligence, and you really create a nice engine sounds to me like that yeah no I, I, I look I, I think there's been a lot there's been a lot of people I mean I think what I'm particularly good at is just identifying the people and trends to put together that will make things happen so for example on the machine learning and side and electrophysiology side my my friend and colleague Amit Etkin uh you know started a company um Uh, Alto out in, uh, from, and he's a professor at uh, at Stanford, and and he created this company uh, that's all built around uh, bio electrophysiology and other biomarkers uh, for prediction. So I was very influenced by him, and he went off and did his own thing and consults a little bit to us. But but I, but it was like, you know, that's where I want to go, and that's that's also where companies, you know, other companies in the space in the psychedelic space really have limited capabilities that they, they may partner with people, they may bring people in, but they're not built at core to be innovators. They're more sort of let's, let's buy up a bunch of different companies or let's, you know, push, you know, MDMA through this through, through to approval, but they're not built around, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of ability, uh, To 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 do the science, um, um, you know that, and that's that's kind of where we're, I think, you know, a little bit different than most of our competitors, you know. So, um, you know, with with a couple of exceptions, that's that's I think what makes us, uh, you know, a, a different kind of company uh, is that we're sort of, you know, we're 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 focused on moving things fast in the clinic, but we're not. That's not the only. The only thing we're we're doing, and it's 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 and it's all pretty much you know under one roof. Now, innovation is challenging. I completely agree to that. Um, let me ask you one question. When I look at the the article, uh, which is titled "With the Harvard Scientists Acting as a Highest Treasure Trove," launches a new psychedelics firm focused on drug analogs. Um, analogs. Um, I did work. I worked in antibiotics. Uh, it's about 15, 16 years ago, and then back in 2006, uh, the market, the investment market, was good for antibiotics. But then it really went southwards and went down. Vaccine was the next space I was. Uh, I did work with, um, and uh, I was raising funds for companies in 2013, 14, and 15, which was basically next to impossible. Nobody was interested in uh, putting anything on the market against viral diseases. And uh, this changed with the pandemic, obviously, and uh, it became a lot easier. Uh, I never worked with um, companies in your field. So I'm really curious. I read in the article that Gilgamesh Pharmaceutical completed that 27 million Series A. It was the article that's uh, May 6, 2021. Um, how is the investment space? How are, invest are investors aware of this great opportunity? Or uh, is it still early so that there is uh, some work that needs to be done on the investment side well there's definitely work to be done i mean this was a very super hot space um uh you know sort of psychedelics longevity things you know there were all these sort of hot you know areas that you know the christian Engermeyer was in every one of Uh, and, uh, and Bitcoin and Bitcoin. So. Bitcoin. Yeah, and they often put together the same people. They're interested in all all, all those three things, you know. And um, so uh, it, it's been, it was very hot. And then, of course, you know the uh, as you you know know better than me, the whole you know biotech sector has been you know pretty much slammed uh, 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 in, in in recent times. And um, and I think uh, that uh, that's now had a some, somewhat chilling effect on, I think, uh, uh, the whole space. 
And I think, you know, we're sort of in a little bit of a lucky position, um, you know, because we think that, you know, we've we we raised, you know, our Series A. Um, we're we're um, we're now, uh, you know, uh, got, you know, we're we're now sort of doing pretty well, uh, you know, even beyond that. So we we're we're right now very well funded, you know, to sort of uh, weather the, you know, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, winter uh, uh, in space. So, uh, we think that right now, you know, we have, we'll, you know, we're, we, 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 we're, we're, it's pretty clear we'll have enough money to run multiple programs into, into human data, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and build out what we need to build out. And so, you know, um, and then data will rule, you know, so I think if the data looks good, um, then, uh, you know, and hopefully in a, a year or two, uh, you know, it's it's all you know, kind of somewhat uh, trends. Uh, you know, the biotech space will all sort of recover somewhat from you know some an extreme. So I, I yes, yeah, so I think that, but uh, I, I think that despite that, um, there's still a tremendous interest in this space. I mean, you know, uh, I, no matter where I, I, I'm always still surprised. No matter where I go, putting aside investors, just the population is pretty well versed around this whole psychedelic revolution. People are interested, people are trying it, um, you know, especially in the, probably on the, you know, coast, like in New York and California. Um, so, um, so I think that that, that will continue and build, uh, you know, the press has been, you know, uh, you know, back in the, in the, in the old days, the press was, you know, you know, drugs will kill you every, you know, uh, any, uh, uh, you know, psychedelics are terrible. And now, you know they they can't write enough exciting articles about how exciting the space is. So I think that's helping. I think what's you know limited still is you know the you know big pharma, um, some of the you know the 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 the, the you know larger institutional uh, you know venture capital kinds of folks are still sort of watching this carefully. But you know with a few exceptions like Atsuka, you know most of these pharma companies are still sort of on the sidelines sort of watching what's happening but it's very clear they understand the potential of these things it's just that you know they tend to be they tend to you know what they, i'm curious what is hold in your opinion what is holding the traditional life science vcs back um i mean when i think about oncology for example oncology is a no-brainer you can put any oncology project on vc's table and as long as they are doing something novel and innovative which is quite normal in that space, um, they step in. I think it's also pharma. What is the reason that you say that uh, the VCs or the life science VCs are aware of the opportunity, but not really willing currently to step in? I, I, I think you, you may have ideas about it too, but I think that part of it is that they're looking at whether big pharma or pharma in general is you know, sort of buying into this. Because in some ways they're the customer, right? You mm -hmm. know? Um, and I think that uh, big pharma uh, is still, uh, you know, looking to see, you know, what is the business model here for these things? Um, how well do they actually work in trials? Um, you know, they they they're 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 being you know cautious about about it, um, and um, and and they want to sort of you know. Just just as Pfizer was not the first statin, you know, uh, they, 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 you know they're waiting around, and and some of it's also that some of these early first level compounds they lack uh, innovation, they lack IP. So you know, none of these companies is going to buy uh, a drug with no IP. That makes no sense at all. Um, so I think that there and there and with with a company like us, we're just entering the clinic. Um, in the fourth quarter. So that's, you know, so, uh, so I, I'd expect that, you know, a year from now or so, uh, that, you know, there'll be very interesting conversations going on if we're successful. Um, so, and but when I understand your approach, you're creating drugs with novel IP with a very strong uh, patent protection. And then you bring that to the market. I understand, for example, I mean, I had a conversation last, um, It was in October last year in, uh, with, with a researcher in the longevity space. And there I had really difficulties to say, okay, 
how does a truck look like? And he said, okay, there is no truck. So it's basically uh, just change your habits, change your lifestyle. And this is really hard to sell to VCs, to put money into a company that at the end of the day, don't create novel IP and they don't create something, a product. Uh, right. As far as I understand your description also with some existing approaches on the market, it's basically um, going into the generic space, repurposing drugs, but um, not with very strong IP protection. And Gilgamesh changes that. So your approach is clearly to uh, go down the drug development route. Well, yeah. And, and, and what we expect is that these other, the, the fact, because there's been a lot of sort of excitement, Christian Engermeyers and Peter Thiels and these people who have been funding, uh, Mike Novogratz, a lot of these people that have been funding the space, um, it's been very valuable because, you know, by the time we and, and Jane Jay with Spravato, that they're building out the market, they'll build out some of the infrastructure for these things. Um, so, but they're doing it with molecules, including J and J that have, you know, limited or, you know, weak intellectual property, which, you know, just goes to show you how much, you know, desperation there is for molecules is that J and J was willing to develop an, a non-patentable molecule. Uh, you know, S ketamine obviously has been around for 50 years or something. Right. So, um, so, so, so this, 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 uh, you know, is, 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 you know, I think was very surprising, uh, but it, it speaks to, you know, the, the level of demand, but yeah, I think that that's what, that's, what's going to happen is that, is that as these things are shown to be effective and, um, and, uh, you know, the compasses of the world and a tie and, uh, and maps and, uh, whoever else, uh, you know, puts, effort into this space, it, it, it all is, you know, I think a, a wind at our back. Um, and, you know, at this point also, we're very happy that we're a, uh, kind of, you know, thriving private company. Um, and right now not, you know, not having to, you know, be looking at stock prices. This is always a good thing. I think currently the stock market is, uh, in unknown territory, I would, uh, would flash it that way. Um, do you see uh, some disruptions in your area? I mean, um, uh, or is it business as usual? Is there any in the United States in, in uh, on the East Coast? Is there nervosity on the market or is there uh, any fear on the market, in your opinion, uh, when it comes to funding in your area? I, I, I think that funding has dried up um, you know, we, we just kind of have been just in time to, you know, kind of make sure we're, we're, we're pretty well funded. Um, but it, at the mark, I think a lot of these markets have dried up to a large degree. Um, and, um, and so that will be interesting to see what happens because, you know, when, everybody was excited about this stuff to the extent that almost anything could get funded. You have just a lot of, you know, dubious things, uh, people throwing a lot of money at a lot of dubious things. And so I think what we're starting to see is, you know, a lot of those things are, are you know, will not be able to raise money and will fold. And But some of them are so dubious, there's not much for us to do about it. It's not like, oh, that's a great project. Why don't we buy it? You know, uh, there's not that many things that seem all that valuable, but maybe there'll be one or two. But um, but we think that that's what's going to happen now. So there's going to be a you know considerable consolidation, and you know it'll be a tie and Gilgamesh and uh, uh, and you know maybe one or two other names that all uh, you know will you know will remain the you know sort of doing the the bulk of the work. No, I think um, you're absolutely right that the market is a little bit in a turnaround situation. What's uh, interesting to me is that uh, when you remember the last two crises, one was in 2000 and the other one in 2008, there was much more fear on the market. What at, at the moment, what I miss is this, this fear moment. So it was amazing the last three to four or five years, you were... Uh, you were mentioning some names. I mean, they invested in Bitcoin, they invested in uh, longevity in the psychedelic space, and they did a lot of groundbreaking work. And with that came a huge push also on the public market. I just, I just think about um, Kathy Wood, for example, with her investment approach. Then in the tech sector, there was a market correction 
many public companies corrected between 50 to 90 percent and this also has ripple effects on the private market but what i miss still is these are these fear moments so that people are really fearful and uh, pulling money out and uh, also from other sectors this has not happened yet what's your opinion on the market development when it comes to investments in the coming one or two years in general general economy I'm not a, a macroeconomic expert, so uh, I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. But um, I mean, I, you know, the, you, you certainly get the feeling like, you know, the, the stuff pushed at me is that, you know, we're entering, you know, a period where things are going to be, you know, uh, there's going to be more fear and more discounts over the next couple of years. Uh, and, um, and that, uh, you know, uh, you should, you know, batten down the hatches, you know? So, uh, uh, so we, you know, that's, that's the, the word on the street. Now, what exactly, what happens, I think, you know, is, 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 uh, you know, uh, and not in, entirely clear, but you would just think that we, this is one of those times where tremendous amounts of money were flowing into everything from everywhere, including the government. Um, and when that music stops, you know, uh, you know, you know, you 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 tend to to see some some big problems uh, arise and uh, and a lot of strain. So I think that uh, you know, uh, but on the other hand, you know, uh, I think that the 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 biotech sector was already sort of in correction for mm -hmm. quite a while now. So. If you think about it, it, it like I'm guessing, and you you may know better than me that you know th those sorts of cycles will typically last for you know one, two, th two, three years, something like that, and um, at, at, you know at most. And so you know I think we may be at least for biotech sort of half halfway or so through that cycle, um, but it's hard to know. When I look at the challenges in fundraising in 2008, I think the companies that are following your approach, that you create solid IP, that you are innovative, there is always market, uh, there's always capital on the market for such companies. Yeah, that's what we expect. So we're we're trying to take all of the you know doom and gloom uh, you know uh, messages I get with a grain of salt. That you know if we if we create some strong products that actually are an answer to some of the mental health problems that exist um, and, and, and that are really, you know, differentiated that we should be able to, you know, there should be capital uh, that will uh, flow into that uh, almost in any kind of market. I mean, when you look at the statistics, there is uh, this, this is termed dry powder. There is enough capital in, in VCs. So they were quite successful in fundraising. Um, the difficulties that I see are companies that are not really innovative, but it's in all sectors currently. So that uh, the Me Too products, for example, where, where people just see, okay, uh, 10 companies are doing something novel and I'm the 11th or 12th company. And then the other ones... Uh, which is also something that helps failing is when the product development doesn't move forward. So when they are just stuck in the discovery stage or in the preclinical stage, and there is no progress in the product pipeline. But I think as long as the company creates IP and uh, holds the team together and moves the lead candidates forward into the clinical development area, I think there is, there's, no, there's not much to worry about. Yeah, I mean, I th I I think uh, uh, we're we're right now, you know, sort of all eyes are focused on, you know, uh, this coming year's data data readouts and and uh, and building building the, you know, building the uh, our, our capability to run these trials and uh, you know, kind of pretty excited about, you know, pretty much every month there's some innovation that's going on in the chemistry space. Um, sometimes I don't even know what's happening. There's so much going on. So I think it's, you know, it, I, I'm encouraged that, and, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm rooting, you know, I, having started perception, I'm, I'm rooting for the Atai people too. Uh, but I think that, you know, there's, there's going to be, uh, you know, room for, 
uh, for, for a few good companies in the space. Jonathan, it's amazing listening to you and I learned a lot about psychedelic drug development. We have five minutes left. You said that you need uh, to run off in uh, at 11 o'clock. You have the next meeting. Let yeah. me ask Let me ask you one, one final question. Well, we were talking about fundraising. Uh, is Gilgamesh open currently uh, to talk to investors? So there are some investors in the audience. Uh, if someone gets interested, can they reach you? Are you open for investment or uh, are you waiting for your clinical data and then start the next round of financing? Yeah, um, we're. I, I think there's a small window that uh, right now, if people are are were you know interested in uh, investing in Gilgamesh that, that they should they can contact us and we can we can explain to them where we're at with that. So there's some there's some there's some optionality uh, uh, you know in the in the very near future. What's the best way to reach out to Gilgamesh? Is it directly to you via LinkedIn or uh, do you have an email address that uh, people should? Yeah, yeah so, so certainly I'm on LinkedIn and I check that uh, periodically and then uh, they can uh, you know also. Uh, directly reach out to me is fine, which is uh, jo John J O N at Gilgamesh Pharmaceutical, not not plural, but singular uh, uh, dot com. So J John at Gilgamesh Pharmaceutical dot com. If you don't mind, I would add it to the description of the podcast so that when someone is interested, they can directly totally. connect you. Um, did, did, did did I miss something? Do we want to add something at the end of the podcast? Is there a topic, a question open that you would like me to ask? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think we've covered a lot of material, um, and um, I, I think that uh, you know the. Uh, um, I, I I think that one of the interesting things about this space is that, you know, for people that have never uh, experienced these sorts of drugs, it's almost uh, ineffable. It's really hard to almost describe the, the, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, so the word psychedelic means mind manifesting, you know, the sort of uh, way in which these things are sort of a way uh, a way into, um, you know, understanding human consciousness and understanding uh, some of the challenges that that people have. So, um, so I think uh, you know I'd in, encourage people to you know uh, um, to to read about it and and to you know uh, and uh, to uh, be uh, uh, to, you know sort of to, so look at this uh, what looks like a um, you know, a, a true revolution in, in, in psychiatry, you know, that, uh, that this, this is going to happen now. And uh, who, who ends up winning the, the, the race and such as, you know, anyone's guess at this point, but we think that, you know, Gilgamesh probably has a good, a good shot at, uh, at, at being uh, a major player in the space. And, you know, when we look back now, you know, a few years from now, so no, I, I think there's no particular, uh, uh, other uh, uh, questions. I think you know we've covered some of the issues around how these uh, drugs uh, have this way of um, of changing uh, the brain, of of causing neuroplasticity, and that you know that this is it's interesting because it's a very unusual experience uh, uh, for psychiatrists because the drugs are both enhancing people's ability to have insight about themselves. And at the same time, they're having sort of direct biological effects. So, uh, so I think, and, you know, even if they, th 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 there's a way in which those things probably go together in a certain way, but there's a psychological or sort of software experience of, of these things. And then there's this sort of hardware, you know, effect on, uh, on the actual um, synaptic um, and, and circuitry uh, of the brain, uh, that, that these things are sort of changing. And, and, um, and, uh, the, and so I think it's a very interesting time right now for us because of that fact that, you know, those are sort of a little bit like, you know, lights, a, a particle in a wave, you know, it's sort of like the, they're, they're working through psychological mechanisms, but they're also working through, you know, uh, second messenger signaling cascades, uh, uh, and uh, and changes in um, in the complexity of neurocircuitry that you can read out in neuroimaging uh, experiments and such. So 
I, I, I think that uh, we've covered most of the most of the uh, excitement here, and I think um, uh, you know I'd be more than happy to to uh, chat with folks who if they're if they're interested in hearing more. And I completely agree to what you say that uh, there is a huge need in society for your products and for your developments. And I'm looking forward to hear more from your team and uh, the clinical results then I think next year when they when they are available. And maybe we do another episode when you see how the drug works then in the clinic center, what the results are and what the next steps are of the company. Yeah, well, thanks. For this. It's been a great uh, pleasure and and, uh, and and very enjoyable. So I'll I'll, I'll look forward to uh, uh, our, our our next podcast episode. Thank you very much for your time, Jonathan, and all the best and good luck for your team. Have a great day. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye. Did you like the episode? Then please, please, please leave a five star review on Spotify and Apple, and make sure that you like, comment, and share the YouTube episode. It helps that the algorithm delivers the episode to people who also benefit from it the same way than you did. Have a great day.